Hello everyone, I'm George Jardine, and welcome to a free video tutorial on four of the most important controls in Lightroom 4. Highlights, shadows, whites, and blacks. I'm going to admit right up front here that some of these examples have been hijacked directly from my Lightroom 4 develop series, and I've also added a few new ones. But the important thing is how my thinking about these tools has been evolving over time. If you've been following the blog, you might have noticed that I've been doing a bit of exposure testing and writing about the correlations that I'm finding between digital exposure and Ansel Adams' zone system. Anyway, rather than get into a lot of technical mumbo-jumbo in this tutorial, what I'd like to do today is take what I've learned from those experiments and try to give you a quick guide to using these new controls. A visual guide. Because, frankly, What's missing out there in the world of fast food tutorials are solid, practical examples. Examples that you want to look at. Real world examples, if you know what I mean. But I also wanted to create a more visual guide for you because we've got these four new controls and each one of them can now move in either direction. And so, while I think the symmetry of this may get an interface designer a bit turned on, I think it leaves most of the rest of us kind of wondering how it all works. So let's work through four or five images and see if we can find examples of when to use each slider going in both directions. And along the way, I'm going to toss in a few combinations. Highlights with whites and shadows with blacks, that kind of stuff. Because the real juice is in the way they can work together. Starting with the monks in the temple and the old 2010 controls, just for the comparison. For starters, I think my exposure here is pretty good, but I want two things out of it. I'd like for the shadows to be just a bit more open, but at the same time, I don't want them to be flat. And the shadows here are already on the verge of being just a bit flat, so I want to fix that. In the past, when I was confronted with a photo like this, I would almost always do one of two things. When my exposure is pretty good and I want some more light in the shadows, I'll almost always go directly for the dark slider in the tone curve, like this. And this does bring a lot more light into the midtones. But at the same time, this move flattens out the shadows. To bring the depth back, you almost always have to go in and crush your shadows down, something like this. For this photo, I actually think this is a pretty good correction. But the trouble is that using the tone curve like this can have a way of building too much contrast, right through here, where the curve is steeper over the bulk of the darker tones. So it might be time to try something else. I'll reset the tone curve and let's try fill light. Don't panic, we'll get to the new controls in just a minute. But I want you to have this comparison as background for where we're going. When I start to push up the fill light, right away you see that I get a similar type of flatness with this control, this haziness. And this was the classic problem with fill light, flat shadows. And so it became pretty much conventional wisdom that whenever you use the fill light, you would also come back right behind it and either push your blacks up like this or go back down to the tone curve and crush your shadows down by pulling that back over this way. Both of which bring some of that contrast back. I almost always preferred the curve, but it was a choice that you made visually. For my eye, the curve generally gave me a bit more of a natural look while the old blacks control generally added more contrast, and it darkens the entire image slightly, which is hardly ever what I want. But the point is that when you need to lighten your shadows and keep good contrast, you're almost always using two of these controls together, and probably moving them against each other, which just means moving them in opposite directions. And the thing that I found with the new controls is that the concept is exactly the same. When you learn how to use the shadows with the blacks and your highlights with the whites, that's when you get the most control. 
and you're not always moving them in opposite directions. So now that we've covered the basics for the old controls, let's look at how you might approach the very same image using the new controls. Here's the photo with all the new controls zeroed out, and the tone curve is still at the defaults. You know that the fill light control was essentially replaced by the shadows control. So let's start there. Pushing this over to the right, and I get almost the very same effect. It's cleaner than fill light. But still, once you get over here past plus 75 or so, you have the very same flatness creeping up into the shadows. And so, just like with the old fill light control, when I need this much shadow correction, I'm always going to go back in and tweak the shadow contrast by pulling the blacks over this way, which is a nice correction, or by coming down here to my tone curve and crushing down the shadows, like this. For this photo, the two results are slightly different, but they both work. Pushing down the shadows using the curve gives me slightly more saturation in the warm yellow colors, while blacks gives me a cooler result but the contrast can more or less be controlled with either one. So that's an example of using shadows and blacks together, moving them in opposite directions. Next, let's take a look at highlights and whites. This is my classic example for shooting RAW and for keeping your original RAW files forever as your archive. The processing actually does get better over time. Looking at this, we clearly need to bring the highlights down. And with the new highlights control, once you get down to about minus 75, we have an amazing amount of detail coming back in here. The highlights control is not only bringing tone back, but it's enhancing the edge definition, sort of the way clarity does. But at the same time, the highlights seem to be losing contrast because they're getting gray, despite the enhanced edges. If we go over here and look at a true raw gradient, with these top values way up in the high 90s, which is very close to where the tones in the beard are, look at what happens here when I pull highlights down to minus 75. Same thing. All these top EV values in through here become gray. And so I want the detail, which I'm getting, but I also want the contrast, and I do want something to be white. And so this is where you might come back in here and push the whites over to maybe 35 or 40. And that brings it all back without wiping out the detail that the highlights correction gave us in the first place. If I now hit reset, you see the uncorrected photo again with all the blown out highlights. And then hitting undo, you see the correction. So this combination of highlights and whites is giving us a very similar kind of correction in the highlights that shadows and blacks gave us in the shadows on the previous photo. It's when you start to see how you can use these sliders in combination with each other that you start to see the beauty of the symmetry that they've built into the new controls. Then to finish this correction, all I need is a very slight tweak to my tone curve, crushing down the shadows just a tiny bit, and that brings it all together. I'm done. Next, let's take a look at how you might use highlights and whites, only moving them in the same direction. Back to my guy in the walkway, it's pretty clear that I'm going to want to take my shadows up over here to at least plus 60 or 70, right? The highlights are just way too bright to try and do anything with the exposure, at least in the positive direction. So let's start with the shadows and that looks pretty good. It's a huge improvement over fill light. And then about the highlights. What I have here is a lot of very hot highlights, some burning out to total saturation on the sensor with 100s all the way across red, green, and blue. And since I don't want to pull my exposure down if I can help it, it's all going to be up to the highlights. Pulling this back to about minus 60 or so is better but we still have some pretty horrific contrast in here that I want to try and moderate, especially with the added definition that I'm going to get when I start adding clarity, which I know this photo loves. So let's look at it with the clarity. Once I have this combination, 
I've almost got the tones that I want, but how am I going to tone down all this contrast that I'm building up in the highlights? Let's go back to the raw gradient. Only this time, let's go to one that's a stop higher in exposure. On this ramp, the tones over here near the end truly are at sensor saturation, 100% for all three channels. Then pulling back the highlights to about minus 60 or so, right where we had them on the guy in the walkway. And you do indeed start to see better separation all through these top tones. But the fact that the highlights control adds so much edge definition just gives the walkway that much more apparent contrast. It worked great for the monk's beard, but on this walkway, it's just too much. And so this is where you might use highlights and whites in combination. Pull the highlights down somewhere in here, and then if you feel that you're building too much contrast, pull down the whites too. The whites control grays the highlights in a much more gentle way than the highlights control does, and it doesn't add any of the edge definition as it goes about its business. And so for a screen correction, using highlights and whites, both in the same direction, works to our advantage with this photo. I might not want this much gray in the highlights for a print correction, but for the screen, this works. The image has enough apparent contrast that the highlights don't feel flat, even though there is some gray in there. Okay, so in the shot of the temple, we looked at how you might bring up the shadows by pushing it to the right and how to maintain contrast in those shadows by using blacks or the tone curve. And then on the monk and the guy in the walkway, we looked at how you might use highlights in combination with the whites control to either increase or decrease the contrast in your highlights. And for me, that covers pretty much 95% of all my photo corrections. Each photo will require a different combination, usually moving the pairs against each other, but also sometimes moving them in the same direction, like we did here. What that leaves us with is the other 5%. Would there ever be a case when you would push highlights to the right to brighten the highlights? Or would you ever need to pull shadows back to the left to darken them? And the answer to that question lies in understanding the way the controls work. If you remember, you generally use the whites and the blacks as clipping controls. Push whites to the right, and you're creating more tonal separation in through here and clipping the very brightest whites. Pull the blacks control to the left, and you're clipping the blacks, creating more contrast in the shadows. These two controls are pretty predictable, mostly because they don't play games with edge definition. The blacks control does seem to creep up a lot higher into the midtones than the whites control does, but they both basically do the same thing to their respective parts of the tonal range. Highlights and shadows seem to be more radical in their effect, at least when you're moving them in the expected direction. And I think that's because they also muck around with that edge definition. When you pull highlights down, you get greater highlight definition, just like you get in your shadows when you push the shadows control up. But then, if you were to push the highlights to the right, which I think you would hardly ever do, your highlights do get brighter, as expected, and they gain some contrast through most of the top end. But rather than getting the edge enhancement when you go this way, Lightroom gives you a very slight softening of the edge contours with positive highlight numbers. So take this photo of the eyeglasses. All I have here is a tiny crop and I've converted it to black and white. If I were looking at this, the first thing I would want is a strong black and more contrast. So I'm gonna pull my blacks back like this, right? And then to bring some light back into the midtones, I would push up my darks on the curve, just because that's the way I think. So that's better. I've now got the basic brightness and the black point about where I want them. But the photo still feels a little flat to me, and that's because the highlights are still gray. I don't want this stuff up here to completely burn out to white, but almost. And so this is where I might take the highlights control and push it to the right, increasing contrast in the highlights, but still preserving that tiny bit of roll-off into pure white 
which helps keep a more film-like look in the highlights. Remember when you pull highlights to the left? You get more tone in your highlights and you get some pretty radical edge enhancement. When you move highlights to the right, you get more contrast in the highlights, just like you would with whites. But the edge definition thing reverses when you go to the right, softening the details, all of which contributes to a more natural roll-off into pure white for that film look. Now, don't get so tangled up in all this that you miss the obvious. Notice that if I go back to my starting point here with this snapshot and then simply crank up my contrast, I get an almost identical correction. Better, in fact. So that's where a little common sense has to play a role. Let's take a look at this shot of the fisherman in Venice. I clearly need to open things up in the shadows, right? So I'll push that to the right. And then, just like we learned in most of the earlier examples, to preserve the contrast in my shadows, I need to pull the blacks back somewhere in here, right? And so, for the most part, that's going to be my correction. But the thing I'm left with again is this muddiness in the highlights. I really don't want this much tone or color in the sky back here. And so, once again, pushing highlights up gives me the contrast that I'm looking for and that very subtle softening of the edge definition that comes from using highlights rather than whites to brighten things up. Watch what happens if I reset this move on the highlights and try the same thing with the whites control. Whites isn't as strong at first, but then pushing it over here, this is where you really start to see that contrast build. And I start to get these funny colors in my sky. So resetting that, and going back to highlights, this is just way better. Highlights gives me a very nice softness up in here. That, for me, just feels much more film-like. So, if pushing highlights to the right builds contrast in the highlights in a more gentle way than whites does, what would you expect shadows to do relative to blacks when you move them in the counter direction? Up until now, we've pushed this control to the right to open up the shadows. But when would you ever pull it to the left? And the answer is the same as for the highlights, only in reverse. If you remember when we finished up with the monk, I wanted to bring back just a tiny bit more depth into the shadows here, after the highlight correction. And I did that with the tone curve. But you'll notice that if I play with this, how fast the contrast builds in an already contrasty photograph. And the same thing goes with the blacks. If I push this down to be sure I've got solid blacks, the whole thing just becomes too hard. And so, this is where, if I still needed a tiny bit more depth in the deepest tones, but wanted to avoid overcooking the entire thing, this is where I would look at the shadows control. Pulling shadows back to the left gives me a roll off into the dark tones that has a lot softer edge to it. Just like rolling off the highlights into white on the fisherman, this pushes down my shadows and rolls them off without creating nearly as much contrast. The very same thing is true here with my Fellini girl. I love the light in this photo, which I'm bringing up as high as I can with this move on the tone curve. And I love the softness of it, so I don't want to destroy that with too much contrast. So, if I get to here with my correction, and I like what I see, but I feel that the shadows could be just a tiny bit deeper, dragging shadows back this way gives me that slightly deeper shadow, without adding too much contrast to this shadow side of the face. And so, I think the irony of learning the new controls is that highlights and shadows have sort of a dual nature. When you use highlights to preserve highlight detail, it has a very strong personality, much stronger than whites when moving in the same direction. But when you use whites for clipping, it becomes much stronger than the highlight control when you're moving that in the same direction. But they're different, just like shadows and blacks are different in the same kind of unexpected way. In the end, it's not about fancy terminology or pseudo-academic crap about how the adaptive highlight recovery works. It's about looking hard at your pictures, playing with the controls, and learning how to trust your eyes. Remember, 
There are no rules. Every single photo is a challenge for you as the artist. And that is exactly as it should be.